Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I, it's really hard to see uh, everyone with this slide. Uh, so if, if, if you cannot hear me, just, just shout out and I'll try to adjust the microphone. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Cool. cool. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shishir, uh, and I'm here to talk about red team and attack vectors uh, for operation technology. Uh, my objective here uh, is to go beyond the hypothetical, uh, and I'm here to talk about red team and attack vectors uh, or real-world examples from some of our red team exercises for critical infrastructure. However, uh, before I start, a quick disclaimer. Uh, even though everything that I present here is based on real-world case studies, the content itself is highly redacted to remove any and all identifying information. Uh, now, we're not here to talk about myself, but uh, it's still customary to do a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Shishir. Uh, I'm a technical manager at Mandiant slash Google. Uh, I'm part of a dedicated team uh, at Mandiant that specializes uh, in security services for operational technology and control systems. Uh, personally, uh, I've been, uh, I've had have more than 12 years of experience uh, performing offensive security work for industrial control uh, and cyber physical systems. Uh, and in that time, I have been fortunate to, uh, to, to basically dabble uh, with almost every critical infrastructure sector uh, on, the, on the planet, uh, including power, uh, transport, uh, uh, rail, air traffic control, manufacturing, uh, wastewater, uh, telco, and even building management systems. Now, uh, I believe everyone here would already understand what we mean by operational technology. Uh, that said, I still wanted to take a minute and remind that operational technology basically deals with systems and platforms that are used to control and automate industrial scale physical processes. People often tend to silo OT into a specific sector or industry, uh, but I'd like to remind that OT covers a wide range of infrastructure, uh, and my talk here is industry agnostic. Uh, I'll be covering examples from different verticals, uh, including power, utilities, transportation, manufacturing, uh, in, and even telecommunications. Uh, I, would like, I would also like to call out that real-world attack simulations uh, against industrial networks do not involve just HMIs or PLCs, uh, but in fact uh, involve the entire ecosystem, ranging from the enterprise network that supports OT uh, to level one devices that control the physical processes in the field. Uh, one more disclaimer here, uh, offensive security exercises such as red teaming and penetration testing uh, essentially involve adversarial testing against uh, cyber physical systems that can pretty much blow and burn. Uh, thus, any kind of uh, offensive security testing for OT uh, should only be performed uh, by trained individuals uh, after careful consideration of scenarios, hazards, risks, and pre-approved rules of control engagement. Now, before we move into the crux of the stock uh, and talk about attack vectors and case studies for OT, uh, I'd like to quickly touch upon one more topic, uh, that is the ICS OT attack lifecycle. Most people in cyber are already aware that, uh, of, of attack life cycles, uh, but when we talk about hacking OT, people often tend to assume that we are talking about some cool exploit against an isolated ICS or a control system device. Uh, so I'd like to call out uh, that there is a difference between hacking an individual control system and hacking a large-scale industrial OT operation. Real-world OT attacks are rarely single-step compromises, uh, often involve uh, a multi-step attack lifecycle uh, covering multiple phases. Uh, from an attacker's perspective, uh, this typically translates to information gathering, perimeter breach, privilege escalation, internal reconnaissance, network propagation, and finally, a precise execution to achieve a predetermined objective in an OT environment. The basic idea here is to obtain prior information about the target system, breach the protected perimeter of the OT environment, remain undetected while operating within the target environment, and then finally launch a precise attack to achieve the target objective. Consequently, if you think about it from the defender's perspective, each phase of this attack lifecycle presents an opportunity for detection and mitigation. Thus, it's important to understand the ICS OT attack lifecycle, identify security issues before an attacker has a chance to exploit them, develop preventive or detective controls for known TTPs, and mitigate attack vectors across multiple phases of the attack lifecycle. Now, I don't believe I have the time to go through each phase of the attack lifecycle in the next 20 minutes. So for the remaining session, I'd like to distill the lifecycle into four key phases uh, listed on the, uh, the lower side of the slide here, uh, and walk through some real-world examples and case studies uh, for common attack vectors uh, across the four phases. Uh, the first phase I'd like to cover is initial compromise. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, the objective of this phase is to gain an initial foothold in the target environment. 
Uh, in most real world scenarios, uh, this typically translates to using a social engineering uh, or spear phishing campaign uh, to compromise the enterprise side of the organization. Uh, in fact, the majority of the red team exercises for OT uh, that we perform begin with some form of attempt to gain access or foothold uh, on the corporate side of the network. That said, uh, the initial compromise phase could also entail uh, other more direct attack vectors to gain a direct foothold in the OT network. Uh, the, slide, uh, the, the list in the slide here lists some examples like direct connection to ICS on the internet, uh, supply chain compromise, third party compromise, uh, hardware implants, uh, and last but not the least, uh, physical or wireless access to OT systems in the field. Uh, industrial environments often have a geographically dispersed field network, uh, often connected using wireless networks and thus present a large attack surface for attackers to gain direct access to OT devices. Uh, the simplest example of such a system here would be residential smart meters uh, in advanced metering infrastructure. Uh, so if an attacker, let's say, is able to gain uh, or manipulate the communication traffic between the residential smart meter and a back office collector, uh, they could potentially use that as an entry point uh, into the back office uh, uh, back inherent system. Uh, the first example I have here is for a communication-based train control system. Uh, in a CBDC network, onboard ECUs in the train typically connect to the back, back office network uh, through radio-based communication such as wireless network or cellular network. Uh, in this specific case, we found that the CBTC radio network was implemented using a hidden but essentially open SSID, thus providing an unauthenticated access to the onboard embedded network on the trains. Uh, the right side of the screen here uh, shows us uh, using the open wireless network to connect to a VNC session on one of the operator uh, displays in the local cab. Uh, insecure wireless networks are probably not as common as in the recent past, uh, but we still find examples of un unencrypted protocols uh, or legacy encryption uh, in older networks. Uh, the next example I have here is for an unprotected cellular network uh, for a public transport operator. Uh, in this case, our team was able to use an arbitrary personal SIM to connect to the private APN for the field network and gain direct access to traffic monitoring cameras across the metropolitan region. Uh, to be clear, uh, this is probably an exception and not the norm uh, to have an unauthenticated uh, private APN, uh, but, but such was the case here, uh, and it does show an interesting example uh, of an initial entry point into an OT environment uh, through an insecure uh, cellular network. Uh, the last example I have here for uh, initial foothold uh, is, uh, is an initial compromise point into a telco network. Uh, modern telco networks uh, are essentially IP-based uh, and involve an IP-based tunnel between the mobile device and a gateway node in the core network. Uh, the gateway node uh, forwards the traffic to the uh, intended destination uh, through a backbone network, and it's best practice to, uh, to basically uh, have the gateway node uh, allow only access to the intended networks and block any or all attempts to access the private nodes in the operated network. However, in this case, we found uh, that we were able to actually use a commercial off the shop SIM uh, for the said operator uh, to connect to the core nodes in the telco network. Uh, long story short, uh, we were able to compromise the core nodes, uh, such, such as session border controller, uh, intercept user traffic, uh, including SMS uh, and voice call data. Now, I realize that it's probably not as obvious from a single screenshot here, uh, but the picture here on the right-hand side shows us intercepting an SMS message uh, from, the uh, from the traffic captured on an SPC controller. Uh, think about using your personal mobile phone uh, as an entry point into your telco operator's network uh, and compromising lawful interception uh, across the national network. Uh, to be clear, this is also very rare, uh, but still it does provide another interesting example of an initial entry point into what is essentially uh, operational network. The next phase I'd like to cover uh, is, in, is internal reconnaissance. Uh, the objective of this phase is to leverage the foothold gained uh, in the previous phase to extract specific information about the target system. Uh, this is especially relevant uh, in the context of initial compromise in the enterprise IT environment. Uh, the enterprise network is important not only from the perspective of IT OT network segmentation, but it is also important from the perspective of data segmentation. A typical enterprise network uh, often hosts multiple sources that can provide an attacker uh, with critical information about the target asset. Uh, some examples on the, on the slide here include documentation, uh, uh, department of file shares, uh, email communications, uh, development resources, management consoles, and even key logging uh, and screen mo uh, monitoring. 
Uh, some examples of target information uh, that, an, that an attacker uh, would typically like to retrieve at this phase of the exercise uh, include network diagrams, host names, IP addresses, process documentation, uh, operator manuals, uh, and, and even potentially uh, plain test credentials. Uh, this is probably uh, the most boring uh, stage of an attack lifecycle from an attacker's perspective. Uh, but in my experience, uh, an attacker will spend the maximum time operating within this stage because the more information that I can obtain at this stage, the higher my chances of success and precise execution in the subsequent stages. Uh, internal reconnaissance often comes down to strategic targeting information sources uh, and key employees uh, that are responsible for the administration and maintenance of the OT environment. Uh, I realize that the screenshots here on the, on the slide uh, are highly redacted. Uh, however, they still provide a snippet of the kind of information uh, that an attacker might target during internal reconnaissance phase. Uh, firewall rules, operation guides, uh, department shares, plain test credentials, password managers uh, are all critical information that are typically hosted in the enterprise side of the environment, but provide invaluable sources of information uh, for attackers targeting OT networks. Now, from a defender's perspective, it is easy to underestimate the value of the information exfiltrated during this phase of the attack lifecycle, and security teams, in my opinion, often ignore the importance of this phase from a, from a detection perspective. Uh, in fact, I would argue that this phase provides the maximum opportunity for detection. Uh, if I, as a defender, can flag indicators of compromise uh, for internal reconnaissance in my enterprise environment, uh, I could potentially detect an attacker. Uh, before they even have a chance to reach the OT environment. Uh, now, uh, I'm not going to go into specific uh, case studies for this phase. Uh, almost every exercise that we perform involves uh, some kind of internal reconnaissance, uh, but I still wanted to cover some examples uh, of targeted sources uh, and information sources. Uh, moving on, internal recon uh, it's an initial compromise in internal reconnaissance is often followed by network propagation. Uh, in the context of a typical attack lifecycle, this often translates to network propagation from an initial foothold in the IT network to the target system uh, in the OT network. Now, I know that we all expect our OT systems to be completely isolated in air gap using nothing but space. Uh, however, in practice, that is rarely the case for modern industrial environments. Uh, in, a, in an ideal world, uh, I would probably love to see perfect segmentation using uh, unidirectional gateways. Uh, however, the reality is that we still continue to find OT environments that lack basic segmentation. Uh, now, there are probably a million different ways uh, to hose up segmentation, uh, but some common examples of insecure segmentation between IT and OT uh, include lack of properly secure authentication for remote access, uh, dual home servers with one leg in IT, one leg in OT, uh, shared Active Directory domains or domain trust between IT and OT, uh, and exploitable services uh, in OTDMZ. Uh, that said, uh, the most fundamental issue around IT-OT segmentation uh, is the use of shared infrastructure and management platforms. Uh, a classic example of that uh, would be a hypervisor server hosted in the IT environment, uh, which hosts guest machines for OT network. Uh, so potentially, if I can compromise the hypervisor server in the IT environment using active directory credentials, uh, I could pre pretty much gain access to the OT consoles, thus bypassing the firewall rules between IT and OT. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, it is very common to find both physical uh, and logical flaws in segmentation between IT and OT, uh, and such issues can often be used uh, to propagate from the IT network to the OT network. Uh, this slide here uh, shows an example of installing a keylogger uh, on a compromised engineer desktop uh, in the IT network uh, to basically obtain the single factor authentication credentials uh, for a remote access point uh, or a jump host server in the OT network. Uh, the screenshot on the right hand side here uh, shows, us, uh, shows, shows us basically uh, connecting to a successful remote desktop connection uh, to an HMI interface uh, for, an, for a subway line or a subway overline. Uh, this uh, is another interesting example uh, of compromising remote access credentials in the corporate network. Uh, however, this time uh, through direct compromise of an enterprise password manager or an enterprise password vault, uh, which basically stored OT credentials. Uh, enterprise password management systems often authenticate to uh, corporate domain. Uh, so, so if an attacker is able to compromise the password safe uh, for, say, let's say, for example, engineering teams, uh, the attacker could gain credentials for remote access to OT systems. Uh, the screenshot on the right again here uh, shows a successful uh, remote desktop connection uh, to an ITS server for a traffic control or a traffic uh, light monitoring system. 
this slide here shows an example of, uh, of a segmentation flaw, uh, like I said, using domain trust between IT and OT. Uh, it is probably not as clear uh, from the screenshot uh, that I have on, on, on the slide here, uh, but you, you will find that the IT domain here is actually superseded as the root domain uh, for OT domains across multiple DCS. Uh, the end result is that uh, my team was basically able to use compromised credentials in the root IT domain to gain access to child domains from multiple plants across the globe. Finally, uh, this is a, a real-world example of the issue of shared infrastructure between IT and OT. Uh, the virtualization, uh, virtualization platform on the left authenticates uh, to an IT domain. Uh, but hosts guest machines for both IT and OT environments. Uh, our team was able to gain administrator access uh, to the hypervisor management interface uh, using credentials compromised in the IT domain uh, and leverage the same uh, to uh, ac gain access to the local console uh, on the guest virtual machines in the OT environment. Uh, the screenshot on the right-hand side here uh, shows an example of direct console access to the guest VM for a WSO server in the OT network, which hosts software updates uh, for engineering workstations uh, in the PCN plant network. The final attack phase uh, I'd like to cover uh, is mission execution in OT. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, this is the phase where we are dealing with core OT, uh, and the, attack, uh, the, the attacker will either attempt to leverage the access that they've already obtained, uh, or launch a pre-built exploit uh, to achieve the final objective. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that an attacker might use in this phase uh, would highly depend on the specific OT system in question, uh, and more importantly, the attacker objective. So for example, uh, there are attacker objectives uh, uh, that could potentially uh, uh, be achieved uh, through direct access and direct control of an HMI, or simply abusing uh, the built-in features of the target system. Uh, while there are some attack, attack, other attack vectors or attack, attacker objectives uh, which might require manipulation of the control logic uh, and input-output signals on the lower level embedded systems. Uh, to be honest, uh, I think we could spend an entire session talking about attack vectors for mission execution in OT, uh, but some common examples in the slide here include remote command execution through HMI interface, manipulation of configuration data for a remote terminal or, or a PLC, uh, spoof communication for an ICS protocol, uh, and last but not the least, uh, pre-built exploit to manipulate the process control logic or the uh, process memory and an embedded controller in the OT network. As a general thumb of rule, uh, it is relatively easier to cause process disruption as compared to process manipulation. ICS systems are built with redundancy, safety, risks, and hazards in mind, and thus high consequence manipulation uh, often requires prior reverse engineering uh, and exploit development. Uh, some common examples of security issues that we typically uh, find while assessing, build, uh, assessing and, build, uh, and, and building exploits for embedded ICS systems uh, include uh, insecure firmware updates, uh, unpopulated interfaces, uh, hidden backdoors, shared SSH keys between different customers, uh, obviously buffer overflows, uh, and then uh, leftover debug functions from development uh, and testing that have carried over to the production systems. <laughs> Here, uh, I'd like to once more stress uh, that we are essentially dealing with cyber physical systems uh, that, uh, and thus any kind of offensive security testing uh, for lower level ICS devices should only be performed in a non-production or a laboratory environment under controlled conditions. Uh, the first example I have here uh, is for a red teaming exercise for a power utility, uh, uh, for a power utility with advanced metering infrastructure. Uh, this shows an example of simply using an HMI command to achieve the final objective, uh, that is, remote disconnect of a target smart meter uh, at a specific location. Uh, our team was effectively able to breach the external perimeter, gain remote access to the command and control interface for the head-end system, uh, and initiate remote disconnect command for the endpoint mirrors. This slide uh, is another example uh, of mission execution through direct control of HMI. Uh, our team was able to uh, gain remote access to the physical access control interface for a building management system, uh, thus obtaining the ability to open doors and turnstiles uh, through simple click of a button. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you the actual pictures here, uh, but effectively we were able to use the command and control interface uh, for the BMS uh, to walk into an operations control center uh, while one of us was actually operating and controlling the doors and turnstiles remotely. This uh, slide shows uh, an example of uh, basically spoofing ICS traffic 
uh, for a locomotive control system. Uh, the screenshot shows us plugging into an onboard Ethernet switch in the locomotive cab and manipulating the speed sensor reader uh, or reading on the operator's screen. Uh, the train here obviously is not moving at 80 miles per hour. Uh, this is essentially the effect of spoofing canvas traffic uh, through an existing binary on uh, one of the ECUs on the embedded network on the train. Last uh, but not the least, uh, I have here an example uh, of using debug features uh, to manipulate the input-output signals for a light rail vehicle control system. Uh, it's actually quite surprising how many times one might find uh, a debug console enabled in a production environment. Uh, and this can often be used to manipulate control signals and input-output signals beyond the intended. Uh, the screenshot uh, here on the left basically shows us using a vendor IDE, which I'm not going to name. Uh, to basically connect to a live uh, unit on an LRV uh, and using force tables uh, to override input-output signal tags uh, for the uh, vehicle control system. Uh, again, unfortunately, I cannot show the video here, uh, but essentially we were able to access uh, or gain access to an IP-based Ethernet network on the LRV, uh, connect to the vehicle control ECU and override operator input uh, for doors, throttle, direction and even emergency braking. Uh, if you ever seen a movie where you see like a hacker, hacker uh, scribbling on a, on a laptop trying to stop a train, uh, this is exactly that, uh, but much worse, uh, because we were actually able to uh, control the throttle, uh, basically override the dead man switch, uh, move the train uh, and disable all and every, every operator input. Uh, I think I've run through 25 minutes, uh, so I realized that I pretty much uh, run through my slides, uh, but I only have 30 minutes, uh, so I hope that uh, I have been able to provide some practical real-world experience uh, or perspective uh, on some common attack vectors uh, that an attacker might use to hack operational technology. Uh, but if nothing else, uh, I would like to conclude with four key takeaways uh, from my talk. Uh, it is possible to conduct offensive security testing for OT, but such testing should only be performed after careful consideration of uh, risks, hazards, controls, and pre-approved rules of engagement. Uh, Real-world OT attacks are rarely single-step compromises uh, and often involve a multi-step attack life cycle covering multiple phases. It's relatively easier uh, to cause a process disruption uh, as compared to process manipulation. Process disruption can often be achieved through direct abuse of pre-built features of the system, uh, whereas high consequence manipulation often requires prior reverse engineering and exploit development. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, from a defender's perspective, uh, it is important to understand the ICS OT attack lifecycle, uh, develop preventive or detective controls uh, for known TTPs, uh, and mitigate attack vectors across different phases uh, of the attack lifecycle. Uh, cool, that's it. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Uh, I, I realize it's 3 p.m. Uh, uh, on Saturday afternoon in Vegas. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining in and listening in. Uh, if you have any questions, although I cannot see anybody here, uh, but if you have any questions, uh, uh, you can hit me up uh, face to face. Uh, if you want to reach out and discuss in more detail, uh, you can you can reach out to us over email uh, or LinkedIn.